Yeah, well, you know, I heard Trump is going to uh, spend a couple weeks to fumigate the White House. That's true. Hey, I I have uh, pinpointed the exact date of the Obama recovery. It's January 20th, 2017. <laughs> hey, I, I want to make a, a comment. This is uh, not intended as a joke at all. As preliminary, we're going to get rid of the gay man couple from the White House. Michelle Obama was born Michael LaVon Robinson, the son of a crack whore in Chicago. He was a football player at Oregon State, Oregon State University in around 1987, and he left to release the woman trapped inside of him. Got a picture of his hair club for men, ID card. I have two clients from Chicago. One is a member of the Reverend Wright Church, where he knew Mike Robinson. Another one is a member of the bathhouse, and he knew the gay man, Barack Obama. Okay, that's preliminary. But let me just move on to Hillary. Did anybody notice that in August, before the Congress, when Hillary was defending the emails and the really the, the treason charges regarding Benghazi and, and much more, you know, the, the, the ultra high security databases that were released or made available or not protected. Okay, in August, a haggard 70 year old woman appeared before Congress. Does anybody have their wits about them to notice that in the debates, a woman appearing in her 40s was found opposite Donald Trump in the debates. Not only a woman appearing in her 40s, but no wrinkles in her face and seven inches smaller on her waistline, or as my mother would call it, her haunch. Her haunches were seven inches less. Does anybody have their wits available? To notice that that was not Hillary? Well, she certainly aged after the election. No, that was the, the real Hillary again. They had a stand-in for the debates. And she read from a monitor. And even on that dinner, after the, the day after the third debate, Donald Trump said at a dinner when they were both there, both Hillary and Trump were there at the dinner, he said, the woman against whom I debated. Very careful choice of words. He knew it wasn't Hillary. You're talking about the Alfred Smith dinner. I believe mm -hmm. so, yes. That he, was a riot. He did, not ref, he did not refer to her as Hillary in the, the debate the night before, but rather the woman against whom I debated. He knew it wasn't Hillary. We're being played, Rick. Uh, I'm just sick of the, the staging. I mean, I've got a, a smart sister, and she said, Jim, your opinions on Obama are just so crazy. They're married. Can't you see it? They have two kids. And I said, you're a divorce attorney. Have you ever heard of adoption? And they weren't, they weren't even adopted. They were borrowed from a Moroccan couple. And that's on the, the inter internet now, and you can see the two kids, Sasha and whatever. And one kid looks just like the mother. One kid looks just like the father. I'm sick of this, Rick. We're being played. Do you think uh, Barack and Michael will ever publicly out themselves and, and confess that they were the first um, same-sex couple in the White House? Only when their cover is completely blown, and, and then they'll pretend it was no big deal. It's getting blown right now. And where are all the pictures of Michelle Obama pregnant? Where are all the pictures of Barack and Michelle with two little girls? No, no. There are only two older girls all of a sudden. Well, one of my contacts from the, from the, the, the church, the Reverend Wright Church, told me that 
Barack paid 25000 for that beard. That's what they call it. He wanted to do something in public life, so he bought a wife who was gay, a gay man. It's called a beard, and it, he paid $25,000 to Reverend Wright for that introduction. And he was actually told, this is according to my, con my client contact, he was actually told, Mike Robinson might not be suitable for you. He's very unstable and he's violent. Yeah, well, ask Senator Harry Reid, who almost lost his eye, when they're all doing a very energetic gay sex party. And Harry Reid had his eyes on Barack from behind. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Well, you know, you know Harry Reid's brother got beat up the same day. Yeah, well, you know, when you're dealing with an ex-football player, a middle linebacker at Oregon State University with giant shoulders, and notice that in the first three years, how shall I say, Michelle appeared to have no breasts. And then suddenly, she seems to have C cups. It has long been re rumored that Reverend Jeremiah Wright was a, a gay matchmaker in the network of down-low clubs. <laughs> I don't doubt it, but you know, no, no, seriously. Do you know? No, there's a network. There's a network called the Down Low Clubs it, that operate in black churches, and the the gay pastors are matchmakers, and they find beards for um, gay men in their church and get them set up. You know, so it looks like they have a normal marriage. And sometimes, they're, you know, they're marrying them to women. Uh, but the main thing is to provide a cover for them to operate right. in normal society. Now, if, if you're trying to become a, uh, uh, a bank vice president or a, a hardware company vice president, you might have to introduce your wife at some kind of a company party to, just so they can make sure that this guy is on the up and up. That's what the beard is for. But, you know, there are three different separate events where Barack Obama referred to Michelle as Michael in front of hundreds of people. And they had one thing in common. It was after a long trip, and he might have been suffering from some jet lag. One of them is, was in front of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in an Annapolis, Maryland naval presentation. And another one was in the, the White House Rose Garden, where he thanked the press corps for all their cooperation during one of their numerous vacation trips. Okay, I'm just sick of all this. I'm sick of this. We're being played. We, we don't even know if, if Barack has had a double for many of his appearances, like for fundraisers. He spent more time at fundraising and playing golf than he has been at the office. I'm sick of this stuff. I'm almost afraid to ask you what you think of John Ping Pong Podesta. I don't know much about him except that he's been placed at the P Portugal resort where little Madeleine McCann went missing, along with his brother, placed by the U.S. FBI using uh, you know, travel records and things like that, probably phone records as well. Uh, this is the campaign manager for Hillary, and he's probably one of their main organizers for acquiring little children. And, you know, I, I, I really like to blow the cover off the word pedophile and pedophilia. It means child murder. It's killing them. That's what yeah. they do. I, they try to rob their spirits. They use them in uh, what's called snuff films. Yeah, well, they, they, that's for sure, too. But there's uh, the MK Ultra method also. But they have in the MK Ultra is a dual system. They'll pair up kids, sometimes randomly, sometimes they'll just say, well, this is a, you know, an alert little kid. We'll match them up with this little quiet kid. Okay, and what they do is they, they determine out of all these pairs, this is the one who's going to survive, and this is the one who does not. And they actually have the survivor kill their partner and spread the ashes over their own body. This is how they traumatize. Okay, so yeah, there might be used they might be used some for snuff films, but I have a contact who knows Secret Service in the United States government. And he said, Jim, the stories would 
break your heart, curl your ears, and make you vomit for what these Secret Service people see. And I said, just give me one example. He said, well, I'll give you a good one. Ted Kennedy went down to the Mexican sex farm every nine months. And he liked little 12, 13-year-old boys. And I said, so this is just, you know, sick, underage sex? And he said, oh, no. Ted liked to slit their throats afterwards sometimes. And I said, what, when the little boy wasn't to get altogether pleasing? And he said, ah, something like that. Who the heck knows, Jim? These are very sick people. Okay, this is what is being unmasked, Rick. And I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed in Trump that he's not furthering this investigation. He's not furthering the publicity of it all. He's trying to walk away. Okay. Uh, I've got um, mixed feelings about this because I've, I share your concerns about it. Is he, is he walking away from it or is he wisely waiting? He just got through the electoral college. The next thing is the ratification by the house led by uh, the House Speaker, Paul uh, Ryan, and then the swearing in on January 20th. Is he wisely waiting until he gets in place? It actually, he's in the White House before he opens up this can of snakes. Could be. It could be. Rick, it, it could very well be, but I have a, a little bit more of a realistic, sanguine, and pessimistic view. Uh Trump has talked about cleaning the swamp, but I think he's going to have one leg in the swamp at all times. Just take a look at his cabinet appointments, and you could make the same point there. Well, he might be appointing a Goldman Sachs uh, scum for Treasury, but maybe he's biding time until certain things are done, and then he'll get rid of them, say, after two years or replace them after the first term. Maybe. It could be. I'm not going to give him too much benefit of the doubt when I saw some of his picks. Some of his picks are not just suspect. But if, if you have Goldman Sachs running Treasury, you've got no change at all in the dollar. Of course, you can make the argument that, oh, Trump is just making sure that there's going to be plenty of, of QE, easy money in order to set up the trillion dollars in projects for infrastructure in the United States, which, by the way, will have a gigantic trickle-down positive effect. I mean, I mean, I mean, Rick, that would have 20 times, maybe 100 times the, the power of trickle-down compared to Obama's moronic uh, stimulus plan that basically just put money in consumers' pockets and it evaporated in, in six to ten weeks. Jim, have you noticed that Goldman Sachs never maneuvers to have their man in agriculture or VA or HUD? I mean, <laughs> well, I'm not yeah. sure they have any guys for right. that. Right, I'm just saying, you know, it's Treasury. They want Treasury. Treasury is powerful. That's where they fight it. Well, ever, ever since 1992, uh, when Robert Rubin was assigned at Treasury, but there was someone before that. It was, it was. I think his name was Michael Regan. In the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. R-E-G-A-N. I think Michael Regan was a Goldman Sachs or or a Wall Street animal, put it that way. Um, and he changed to become chief of staff. I, I remember that very clearly, but I'm not I'm not real clear on on where he came from. But I remember that. There was a lot of talk in the Reagan administration. Oh, my gosh. Reagan assigned a Wall Street guy to be treasury head. And that was the big news item. And it was Reagan, not Reagan, but yeah. Reagan in the Reagan administration. OK, so, you know, they're running the Treasury Department. They're ransacking all the, uh, the, the machinery for whatever they can get on insider trading. I mean, I'd love to know the record of, of losses for Goldman Sachs trades when it had to do with anything related to the government in the United States. I don't think they have any losses. Uh, I think they've got about a 500 streak event of positive gains. In other words, they tip themselves off and they they just take a look. They probably had, you know, 
call options on the TNX for the big rise in the 10-year yield. They probably make, made a ton of money on that. By the way, I got a little opinion that came from Eurorage that you might find interesting, Rick. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we, 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 the, the treasure bonds have risen in, in yield. And uh, some people are saying, oh, my gosh, I guess it means that uh, Trump's going to add to the deficit. And Obama didn't? What kind of argument is that? Doesn't make any sense at all. No, it, it's, it has to do with something a little bit deeper. Eurorush said, Jim, I, I, I did a kind of a tour of, of several guys very well connected in Europe. And here's what I learned from my London and Europe connections. The Treasury bond yield didn't offer the Japanese a sufficient differential to do arbitrage. In other words, the carry trade in reverse. They'd borrow their own money. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny and ridiculous. They'd borrow their own money and get paid for it because they have negative interest rate. And then they'd go invest in the 10-year yield, 10-year bond uh, with, with the United States government, and they'd earn the VIG as the difference. Well, the Japanese made a threat, apparently, a few months ago. They told the U.S., we own a trillion dollars in your debt, and we want the VIG to be different. We want a higher yield on the 10-year because we're playing it against our own Japanese government debt. And we can manage the, the currency differences with, you know, hedging. That's pretty easy, especially when we know the direction it's going. The yen is falling in value, which offsets their gain. They, they can manage that. That's simple. You, you make that zero risk. You know exactly what you're what your uh, investment is in dollar terms, and you have exactly that in the dollar versus yen and in your, your futures contract to hedge against it. So the Japanese threatened, look, you're going through hell right now with the Chinese dumping your treasury bonds. You don't want us in Japan to dump our treasury bonds because we got an, another trillion, and now you actually have the Japanese a little bit higher and their bond holdings, I think it's 1.113 trillion, and the, the Chinese are much closer to 1.00 trillion. So the Japanese said, you don't want a second Asian company, country to dump your treasuries. Uh, how about you work out on your Department of Treasury very handy-dandy exchange stabilization fund, that multi-trillion dollar fund. Give us a little bit bigger yield. So... Since July, it's gone from 1.7 or so to about 2.3. And the chart looks really dangerous here, Rick. It's, I think it's going to move toward 3% in the first several months of next year. Um, so that's the little justification for the, the higher yield. It's not from, oh, there's more supply on U.S. government debt. What a dumb argument that is. Obama has increased the – Obama, two administrations – have increased the debt, I, I think something like seven or eight trillion dollars. And now we've got a new phenomenon. We had a 1.3 or 1.4 trillion dollar deficit last year, the fiscal year for the US government, and we're on track for over two trillion this year. But you know, we have a sluggish recovery, which in my opinion is the fascist. Uh, economic garbage. They, they can't say we have a recession that's vicious. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And I have my own little methods for telling that it's getting worse from my business and a couple of clients and colleagues who report to me their business and, and a carpenter friend in Philadelphia. You know, lots and lots of different pieces of information. What's happening with car loans and home mortgages? Well, we have a, something like a 40, 45 basis point rise in the 30-year mortgage uh, just in the last few months. How do you think that's going to hit the U.S. housing market? Oh, so we have a dwindling number of, of applicants for home loans who qualify at, what, the 700 level or 750 level on the uh, – oh, gosh, what do they call that thing um, – their, their, credit, their credit report. It has a four-letter Fair Isaac. Uh, it comes from Fair Isaac anyway. Uh, FICA? No, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a four-letter 
for their, their score, uh, their credit score. It, it, it relates to something that was set up by Fair Isaac mm -hmm. Company. Um, so you're going to have fewer qualifiers, and at the same time, the, the rates going up and the, the amount per month is going to go up. It's still ridiculously low. Uh, I find a 30-year mortgage in the current environment to be a risk that I, as a banker, would not take in underwriting a home loan. Uh, I'd be suspicious of the person's ability to repay the loan. I'd be suspicious of the person's ability to maintain a job for even a two-year period, let alone 30. So I think we're going to see uh, – actually, I had a chart of Australia, Canada, United States, Europe, and a couple of other countries for their real estate index. And believe it or not, the most vulnerable right now to a, a severe uh, pullback in housing prices is Australia. Uh, they're being pushed up by Chinese buyers. The Canadians also have a problem. They've had no correction in the last five, seven years. Neither country has. Uh, Canada has a vulnerability for their housing prices pretty much on their Pacific coast from Chinese and Hong Kong buyers. Uh, for those who don't know much about Vancouver, it has a, a nickname called Hong Coover. Is capital flowing out of China? Well, I think so. Um, I think they're, they're realizing that the, the West is um, pretty much a, a doomed Keynesian experiment laboratory. So I, I believe they're buying up whatever's not nailed down. Uh, I, I think they realize that there, there are a lot of business potential out there in the West – and they want to capitalize on it. If you're a Chinese and you're a multimillionaire, are you going to want to invest in something in Shanghai after all the investment that's taken place in Shanghai? I think you're going to look for some new fresh ground. Uh, maybe look to buy a property in Auckland, New Zealand or Brisbane, Australia or Texas. So I think that there is a lot of money moving out and, and they're, they're, they've got their own capital controls. Uh, you know, pretty small scale. So the Italians are talking about bailing out Monte di Pasci Bank, and and they're looking at something like seventeen billion euros. Um, is, is, that's kind of like feeding snack foods to a wrestling team, isn't it? Yeah, I have a, a, a similar parallel. It's like taking out your wicked pea shooter and firing away at that bus. It's not going to stop a thing. Uh, I, I've made it quite clear that they need a, a $100 billion patch just to start things off. And then they need to repeat it at least two or three times. And they've got to cover some of their own sovereign debt. Where does Italy get that kind of money? Well, they, they don't. They, they're going to have to get off the euro currency and print it or else they're going to lose control of their own banking system to foreigners. All right, so there's going to be an Italian exit from the EU. So that means bringing back the lira. I, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen, Rick, and I think it's going to come only after a, a great deal of nasty debate, maybe a couple murders, uh, and, and more. You, you Okay, the, just look at it this way. Italy watched what happened in Greece. They saw the austerity budget uh, forced upon them by the, the IMF, the German bankers, the EU Commission, those three. Even the Euro Central Bank got involved. So everyone with power financially forced it on the Greek government. Reduce your budgets. Okay, so they had massive unemployment. Then the German banks came in and, and basically grabbed all the assets they could. Uh, you, you could call it asset seizure. You could also call it rape and pillage of the Greek assets and their system. Okay, Italy decided, I think, a while ago, we're not going to let that happen to our country. And there's only one way you can prevent that from happening to, to your country, Rick, apart from growing your way out of it, which they're not about to do, and that is to issue money – and cover their own banking system and say, screw you to the northern bankers. But they cannot issue that kind of money unless they're in charge of their own money. And that means they have to get rid of the euro. 
Uh, you know, when you say exit the euro, you got to be careful. It's exit the union or exit the common euro currency system. Exit the common euro or exit the U the union. I think they're going to exit the common euro currency system and be forced out of the union. And then they're going to see a lot of other countries do the same. The French are another group that have a lot of national pride. I don't think they like the euro. They want to, they want to discount it. You cannot get stimulus in these pigs nations plus France. France looks just like the pigs nations, except they own a lot of the debt for the pigs nations of Portugal, Italy, Spain, and Greece. Okay, you cannot, you cannot continue in this way without a, a stimulus of, of real type. And countries that are beset by debt, who cannot get off the ground, devalue their currency and move forward. We're going to see a gigantic devaluation in the pigs' nations. It's going to start, I think, with Italy and move immediately to Greece. Then you get Portugal and Spain. I'm talking about a 30% devaluation out of the gate and probably another 30% shortly after that. The Italians have a trillion euros of government debt. They need to cover some of that. They have 360 billion euros in banking system debt that's gone bad. Not just debt, but debt that's gone bad. They call them non-performing loans, NPL. Okay, they have a trillion in debt plus a third of a trillion in euros in private banking system. And now you got Monto, Monto de Pachi. How many days in a row are they going to have limit down before they enter failure? I've got a client. Um, who said, Jim, I know about these things. Goldman Sachs will just come up with a, a huge amount of money and it'll, it'll have a source of the Euro Central Bank and, and they'll, they'll find a way to have it devoted pretty much to the European banking system, the ones that are teetering, and, and the problem will go away for a couple months. They don't want the, the global currency reset to happen on an Italian event. And I say, well, that sounds all fine, but there are way too many threats out there. You know, before I lose my, my note on the paper here, you mentioned car loans. Uh, car loans are the new mortgage subprime problem in the United States. We don't fix things in the United States. We can't afford to fix things because we don't have adequate industry to fix things with real income. And we never fix things. As Baby Bush suggested, you know, the moron uh, who liked to, you know, kill cats and dogs when he was a little kid for fun, uh, who became president, uh, he suggested that we go out and spend our way into prosperity because that's what he learned when he cut his economics classes at Yale University. Where are the photos of Baby Bush as a pom-pom cheerleader at Yale football game. Boy, I think that would have been a really lovely photo op for Kerry or Gore to put forward, but that just never seemed to come out, you know, like the damaging photo of Dukakis with his head sticking out of a tank uh, and a helmet on, or John Kerry shown with a bicycle and, a, and a, one of those protective helmets on his head that make him look like a, a little... You know, a little pansy. I feel like a pansy every day when I put on my bicycle helmet, Rick, but I continue to do so because it protects what I consider to be my little treasure called my brain. Yeah, we, we want you to protect your brain. Yeah. Anyway, the car loans are being shoved into asset-backed mortgages all through the United States in their bond industry. They're rotten tranches. And, and here's how rotten they are. You go out and you get a car loan nowadays, and they give you a six, seven, or eight-year loan and a very low rate so that in your first year, like when you drive it home, you're immediately negative equity. You take that 20% uh, reduction from depreciation in your first year, $20,000 car is now worth 16 because you drove it home. You're in negative ground on your car loan, 
because you've got extended terms, small payments, almost nothing going to principal in the first year, and a very low interest rate. Doesn't make any sense at all. They're being shoved into mortgage bonds, and they're rotten all over again. The subprime problem is all back to where it was in 2006 and 7, and its major component for making them rotten is the car loans. All right, so, you know, back to Italy, I, I've got a, a bunch of uh, interesting information and charts uh, for the Italian situation, and it's really a European situation. We, we've, got, we've got the German uh, spread of the 30-year versus the one-year. It, it's now risen up close to 2%. It was down at 1%. Uh, just six or eight months ago, we've got the Italian sovereign bond. <laughs> it, this is laughable stuff. Its interest rate for the bond is lower than the United States. Well, why is that? Do they have maybe a, a better debt ratio versus their GDP? No, they're at 132 percent. The U.S. is a little bit over 100 Um uh, the bad loans for the Italian banking system are something like 360 billion euros. The next closest country is half that at France, about 165 billion euros. And then you have Spain at about 150 billion euros. So Italy is worse than France and Spain combined. Jim, a fast forward one year. December 2017, will the European Union still be intact in its present form? I think no. I think no, not even close. I think you're going to have uh, a couple of splinters. Um, okay, you, you can't talk about Turkey with that. Turkey is NATO, but not in the Union. I think we're going to see Italy splinter off. I think we're going to see Greece splinter off. The Dutch are going to have a referendum soon. Uh, they're going to have a presidential election soon or, or national elections that determine prime minister. I, I can't keep every country straight regarding president or prime minister. Prime minister is from a parliamentary form where they develop these coalitions and there's a leader who speaks for the coalition. Uh, I think the French are going to – if they're not out by the end of the year, they're going to have one leg out the door by the end of the year because they want stimulus. They, they, they're going to reject their socialism. It's going to be quite interesting to watch France because – as they try to reject their socialism, they're going to try to retain their early retirement benefits. <laughs> oh, I tell you, the French are so silly. Uh, they think it, it's perfectly fine to be 56 years old and collect the national pension. Oh, really? Well, I'm 64 years old, and I'm working like a dog, and I enjoy it. And I'm not about to have anybody offer me a, a big, fat pension for doing nothing sitting on my duff. Uh, but, you know, it's the French way. I, I mean, I guess they, they need time to eat, eat their wine and cheese and have their funny looking sideways hat. I, I don't know. I, I don't buy into it at all. I think the French are going to be getting out because they want stimulus for their economy and they're going to realize their nation's bankrupt. Well, Hollande has backed out of the presidential election. Uh, Marianne Le Pen is the leading candidate and she wants out of the European Union. And the EU clowns are, are attempting to punish. Great Britain for voting to leave the Union. How far will they push Britain before the UK pushes back? I, I don't really know, Rick. I, I don't know. It's a, a bit of a, a mystery, but I'm beginning to think that the elite want England to get out of the Union. I know that sounds a little backwards because the the British banking system is losing their passport right for the, the entire industry uh, where they they must pay extra in order to continue doing business with the, the EU continent of countries. So therefore, there are a lot of different businesses that are relocating to Germany. I think Frankfurt is already going to grab a good, good slice of that. But here's a reason why the elite might have wanted all along uh, for – England to get out of the Union. Well, here's a preface. Why is it that Jacob Rothschild made a cool trillion dollars on his bet that England would get out? 
So he probably pumped up the press saying it would never happen while he was betting the other side and made a trillion dollars. To me, that means a few things. It means the press continues to be polluted, but it also means that the elite wanted England out. Why would the elite want England out? Because it can become an island outside the sewer called Europe. The sewer that is being inundated with Arab human garbage and NATO interference. And play a role in the new Silk Road? Uh, as a financial hub, yes. They're working feverishly right now to, to win and uh, retain uh, RMB hub center activity. And there are two things that, that really mark that. Uh, one is the issuance of RMB-based bonds. You know, don't be surprised if Italian government issues five and ten billion dollar tranches of of bonds to fund the Italian deficit that are RMB denominated, sold to investors in England. Don't be surprised by that. The other function of the RMB center is is just simple currency movements and translation. Uh, the European continent has a bunch of, of, of different uh, needs for currencies, whether it's euro or something else, the British pound, etc. And they, they move it through and, and get their RMB out and send it back to China. It has to be done somewhere. Well, they can do it in Frankfurt, Germany. They can do it in Paris. They can do it in Zurich, Switzerland. They can do it in London, England. London is going to be working very hard in a competitive way to retain some financial – uh, business and and Rothschild probably figures well let them deal with their passport problems for the bankers the passport advantage and uh, they'll, they'll work it out it, it's not going to be all that simple but I, I think you know it's it's along the lines of George Orwell only if England separates itself from the European Union can they remain masters of Oceania. They don't want to get bogged down by Europe. They don't want the European Commission, the unelected fascists, to tell England what to do. They're done with that. No, they want some independence, and they're going to get it. But it comes at a price of the passport issue and the banking industry. I think Great Britain should just remind Brussels that uh, England has uh, nuclear-armed Trident submarines. I'd say stop it. I have enough of this craziness coming out of Brussels. We voted to leave. Shut up. We're out. Well, it, that sounds pretty nice and simple and a lot of chest pounding there. But I think the the, the Belgians might say, you know, we're going to deny you access to little boys and little girls for your pedophilia. And then that would hit hard at the uh, at the uh, elite of Great Britain. Hey, let's, what, is all, what is all this talk going on in India about its rapid movement toward a cashless society and the Indian government's attack on gold? You know, to be honest, Rick, I, I follow this a little bit, but whenever I hear cashless, my mind goes blank. I think it's one of the dumbest initiatives ever to come out of the Western elite. Uh, the second dumbest is negative interest rates. If, you, if you're offered negative interest rate, you, you think immediately about moving your money out, out of the banking system and into something that pays a yield and offers you something for the future in, in the way of a gain. If, if there's a cashless requirement, I think you exit the country. What's going on in, in India, I believe, right now is the suicide – of Prime Minister Modi. He was probably given some orders by London, and I don't know what incentive, whether it's profit or, or we just won't kill you next week, uh, but I think Modi was told, we need you to cooperate. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements needs some progress, and we want something coming from these Indian temples and all that gold, it's somewhere between 15 and 20,000 tons. I asked my, my smartest Indian 
uh, contacts, and they say it's it's around 17 or 18 thousand tons of gold combined for the temples and the households. Okay, that's a, that's a lot of bars of gold. They wanted to monetize it. A year ago, the big story in India was uh, take your bar of gold, take it to the bank, exchange it for a CD, a certificate of deposit, earn some interest on your, your money because when it's sitting at home, it's not earning anything. And the Indians are too smart. They didn't fall for it. They don't trust the Western paper. Okay, hand over your gold and don't worry. When the two-year certificate is up, you can get your gold back. Yeah, don't worry. Well, they do worry. and They didn't trust them, so they didn't really do that. They didn't participate in those programs much. Okay, so now we're in phase two, eliminating uh, high-note cash. It's getting very complicated. And Euroraj, on my team of colleagues, um, comes from that corner. He follows three countries very closely, India, Turkey, and Iran. And he said, Jim, here's my quick two cents on what's happening in India. The Pakistanis are using a lot of high denomination counterfeit bills, moving them across and buying a lot of weapons and blowing things up terrorist style. So the Indian government decided the best way to stop that is, is to you know, obviously work hard on the arms sales, you know, like rocket launchers and grenades and whatever. But they also decided, let's go after the, the big bills uh, for the currency, because that's almost exclusively what they were buying with, using the big currency to buy the weapons and using that to blow things up in India. Okay, for those who don't understand, Pakistan and India have religious differences, Hindu versus Muslim. Pakistanis are Muslim. Uh, very complicated, but what I'm hearing now, that we've been in this for over a month, is that several industries, the jewelry, leather, a number of other industries, are all really flat on their backs with big declines in activity economically. Uh, there are millions of people moving back to their little native villages, disgruntled. There are lots and lots of wealthy people who are out a lot of money because of the bill confiscation. And they're trying to offset that with a, a different movement to exchange for, for other currency in the banks. And, and that, that might be successful to some extent, but they've rendered way too much damage to their economy and I think Modi is going to get thrown out of office or put into a funeral pyre. One of the two. I don't know which. I don't really care. But he's committed suicide, not suicide politically. He's committed suicide. You just haven't read yet about his death. Hey, Jim, what's this talk about Dubai imploding? <laughs> well, this is a, a tough topic. Uh, I don't like revealing all of my sources regarding this because uh, he's asked not. Well, it's just you're just you and me talking right now. Oh yeah, right. Well, let me give you a preface about Dubai. They built towers, uh, and you saw in the in the last Fast and Furious movie with Vin Diesel, uh, you saw <laughs> you saw the craziness of you know shooting a car from one tower to another. These towers don't have sewage systems, okay? That's just so you understand how primitive these little cities in the sand are. They don't have suing, sewage, uh, plumbing, tubing, and treatment centers. They do a weekly series of trucks, okay? That's how backward they are. But what's been going on for the last year, and I'm not an expert on this. I just get an update once in a while from a from a fellow who says, "Jim, you know, just don't don't blow my cover." Um, what the the UAE 
princes are doing. UAE is United Arab Emirates, and they've got Dubai, they've got Abu Dhabi, and they've got a couple of other, but those are the two big ones, the wealthy ones. Abu Dhabi is the, the, the major wealth center in UAE. What they're doing now is reacting for the last year or more to a severe decline in income. I was told four years ago they're peeing in their pants for owning over a trillion dollars in U.S. government debt, treasury bonds, overexposed because they were lazy. I actually got an offer. This is kind of funny. In 2014, I got an offer from a fellow in Abu Dhabi wanting to hire me and retain me for advice on how to diversify out of treasury bonds. And it didn't go anywhere, not because of any error I made. It's because I think his princes got a hold of him and said, no, no, no. We don't want to expose our vulnerability and stupidity and laziness to the Western world through a newsletter writer who's got a big mouth. That's me. So they've got all this exposure. They've got all this you know, 50% lower income, and they've got all their lavish spending. You want to wreck someone who's really wealthy, you put him on a 15 to 20 year period where he can be lavish and blow money and, and not have any consequence, then cut his income in half. Oh my goodness. So he will not cut back on, say, welfare you know, rice and beans here in Latin America. I don't know what they use for welfare in Arab countries, but they, they do have their, their welfare for the, the poor. But you don't cut that back because they'll storm the palace. Okay, so you cut back in lots of different ways. What, the, what they're doing in Dubai right now is financial fraud. They're hiring Western companies like McKinsey and uh, Ernst & Young, I think, they're hiring them to falsify documents and to seize assets from businesses located in Dubai. But they're, what they're basically saying is we want you to leave, but your money to stay behind. You have a hundred different banks shut down in the last two years in Dubai. It's not a friendly place to do business. You have stories of Saudi Arabia where they're not paying the Western contractors. And the contractors and their families are stranded in the desert cities. And much the same is happening in the UAE, but they're doing something much worse in the UAE. They're falsifying documents and stealing assets. Well, my next question is the Saudis. How will Donald Trump deal with the Saudis? I'm not really sure, Rick, because I, I don't know. I don't know his... Uh, his main fundamental beliefs regarding Saudi. I, I really don't. We know that he is going to be tough on Islamic terrorism. And if Donald Trump concludes that it's the Saudis that are financing the vast amount of Islamic terrorism, I think he will come to the only conclusion that any sane person can do. And that is you got to, you got to strike at the Saudis. Well, there are three groups that are all wealthy in, in the Arab uh, oil monarchy region that are funding ISIS, it's not just Saudi, it's Qatar and UAE. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch. I, I don't know how it's going to turn out, and, and here's why. He's, he has made statements that he, he wants to end the terrorism. He wants to clean up ISIS. But I don't know that he's going to go after the origin of ISIS, which is in Langley and the U.S. government. Do you? Okay, let me bring this up. Uh, is the CIA running a disinformation campaign to undermine President-elect Trump before he enters the White House? I, I don't know. I, I don't really entertain questions like that. I, I don't know. Okay, we'll move uh, on I believe. I, well, no, I, let, me, let me try a little bit more, though. I don't know, but I do have quite some certainty that the press networks— have been engaged in smearing and lying about Trump for the longest time. And I believe the ties between the executive offices and Langley are tight. I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I've been watching this. 
ISIS issue with regard to Trump for some time now. I noticed that there were two flips with Trump during the primaries, like like very near the, the April Super Tuesday. He used to say things like before the Super Tuesday, he used to say things like, uh, we need to clean up ISIS. We need to make sure that, that it doesn't uh, come to our soil. We need to clean it up, find its origin, kick it out, uh, destroy it at its root. And then afterwards, he started talking more about ISIS as a foreign terrorist uh, initiative that was really with its basis in the Arab world. And it looked to me like he was trying to, to distance himself from any acknowledgement that it was a Langley baby. The, the second flip that I noticed, he said way back when he started the presidential run, we need to cut back the US military budget. It's ridiculous. It's like half our deficit, almost half our deficit. And we don't really get the economic benefit from it. It's bankrupting our country. And then after the Super Tuesday, it was more like, well, we need the strongest military in the world so no one will even dare think about attacking us. Okay, you got to remember, the U.S. defense industry is a trillion-dollar industry that relies on inertia and continued war. This is where I think Trump is going to sell out. All right, let me throw this out to you, Jim. He has front-end loaded his cabinet with four or five retired U.S. generals. Is he stacking the cabinet with retired generals in preparation of a confrontation with the CIA? Possibly, yes. I thought you were going to ask in a different form. Uh, but yes, first of all, I think the generals constitute a civilian coup d'etat. All right, you want to elaborate on that one? There have been a lot of talk in the last year or two about how the military and all the dismissed generals and admirals, 500 of them have been organizing in a movement called America First. They've had regular meetings in Idaho. Are you talking about General Paul Valley? I, I don't know which yeah, generals. He, yeah, he's, he's the leader of it, America First, yeah. Okay, well, America First has a goal of reinstituting the U.S. Constitution yes. and dumping the Patriot Act. In other words, going back to the Republic and getting rid of the fascist state. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay, so I think what we're seeing here is partly that effect in the form of a private coup. There's more to this. I think Trump had to make a deal with two very powerful groups in order to win the White House. The first one was the, the call it Pentagon slash Langley White Hat. The good guys in the Pentagon, the good guys in Langley who want to see our nation restored to greatness and who have seen the Bush family and the neocon bankers wreck it all. Okay. The second group that I think Trump had to make a deal with is the Wall Street bankers. The ones who have all the dollar connections and the machinery, like for the Treasury bonds, in place and working and keeping things moving so that tomorrow we don't have a, a complete wreckage of our economy from simple currency problems and bond problems. All right, so we made a deal with, let's just call it the military side and the banking side. What kind of deal did he make? Make sure I don't get killed by the Hillary fascists, the Clinton-Bush-Hillary faction of fascists. Protect my back. And I'll make a deal with Goldman Sachs. You can continue their game, but we need to move toward the gold standard, and we're going to let you manage this unbelievable nightmare crisis, but since you caused it, we want you to manage the transition. And don't forget the condition. Make sure I don't get shot. So the bankers and the military have been protecting his back. And a Goldman Sachs guy named Nuchin was the number one fellow for fundraising 
for the Trump campaign. Trump did not finance his own campaign. I'm sure he used some of his own money, but I don't think he financed even, even a large percentage. I would guess that it was way under 20 percent. And a lot of the, the fascist neocons, and, and you know, you're starting to see the, the element of the fascist neocons, they cut up across parties. I've had this argument with my brother many times. He said, Jim, neocons Republican. I, I like the Democrats. I like Obama. He's from my district. I said, John, you're an idiot. You're Phi Beta Kappa, economics and political science. You don't know anything about money, and you don't know anything about fascism. All, all you know is stuff you learn in a book, and it's all very, very neat and clean, but it does not apply to this real world because the fascist neocons are both Democrat and Republican, and you're so slow, you're so dumb, you didn't realize that the State Department from the Bush II administration is basically the same people in the Obama State Department, and their little pet project was called Ukraine. Where have you been? And he said, well, I, I don't know about all that. All right, Jim, uh, as we we're down to about two minutes here, so... Barack Obama, on a Friday, made a threat here in December. He made a threat that the U.S. would strike Russia at a time of its choosing and a way of its choosing. That was on a Friday. He, he made this comment on NPR, on National Public Radio. And actually, the story came out Thursday night. On the following Monday, two high-level Russian diplomats were assassinated. Is there a connection? Well, let me just say that the, that the assassination in Turkey uh, appeared to happen without any pool of blood on the floor. Did you not notice that? Well, for five shots in the back, I was wondering where, where the blood went. There should be a lot of blood. It wasn't a shot in the head, but you, you do just two shots in the chest, uh, and you're going to see a lot of blood, and I don't see any in that picture, so I'm not sure what that was. But let's assume it's real. I think what, what has happened now is Brennan of the CIA, who does not like Trump, is trying to sabotage the Trump administration before it even is inaugurated by setting him up with intractable problems with respect to Russia so that Russia might, might actually say, look, we're, we're going to take six months off. We don't even want to talk to you Americans because we're still dealing with some of your violence. And it's not going to be the Trump side that does it. It's going to be the Obama fascists who cut across Democrat and Republican lines. Why is McCain such a good buddy of Obama's foreign policy, except that he's also a fascist? This is Republican-Democrat crossing the line. They, don't, they never disagree on anything with respect to war and foreign policy. So we're seeing some sabotage start early, and I think it's going to continue. There have been two or three events, and uh, you know Obama has, has done a number of things. He's also opened the gates for a tremendous amount of Arab human garbage to come into the United States without proper vetting. Since when do they have the right to uh, come into the country without passing the immigration requirements? Oh, I know. So they can vote in November. Yeah, I get it. There's much more. We're going to see, I think, the climax of this Russian issue with respect to Trump coming up with the appointment and debate for Rex Tillerson, ex-CEO of ExxonMobil, because he received a, uh, I can't remember exactly, friend of Russia or a friend of something award, uh, basically a friend of the Kremlin. He got an award a few years ago. For what? Doing honest business with Russia. Do we have to be at war with Russia? I mean, I'm, I'm an independent thinking person, and I resent the fact that the Rothschilds and their bankers and their media networks are telling me that Russia is an enemy and lying to me about what was done in Ukraine when I know full and well it was a $5 billion State Department project run by Victoria Nuland and the Mossad of Israel to overturn in the Maidan with thousands of vials of amphetamine and rooftop snipers who were, who were hired to create this Ukrainian regime that recently, by the way, Rick, has been told you're going to be orphaned as of January. 
I, I think we're going to see some pretty interesting events take place in Ukraine in the first few months. I haven't been thinking about Ukraine and what uh, is going to happen there when Trump comes into the White House. Orphaned. They're told you're on your own. You're not going to get U.S. State Department assistance. Now, why would they say you're orphaned if they weren't already on U.S. assistance? That's right. Why are they on U.S. assistance? Because we did it. Oh, gosh, I covered very well the Maidan events and, and the snipers and the, oh, gosh, there are lots and lots of accounts of the 10,000 vials of amphetamine passed around. Let them all go crazy and let yeah. them all break let, things. Let's not, yeah, and let's not leave out the, uh, the cargo planes that hauled the gold out of the uh, Ukrainian Central Bank. Right. Well, no, you, you don't understand that, Rick. That, that's to the New York Fed for safekeeping. Oh, okay. They wanted to make sure that the Ukrainian Central Bank had their gold. They'll never see it again, just like the Libyans will never see their 144 tons of gold. That's right. Or, or the former state of Yugoslavia. I, I, I suppose I'm not really clear on, on that story. Yeah. So we've got a lot of events coming up. Um, I, I, I like to repeat that I believe Trump has one foot in the swamp. And I don't know, you know, I, I have experience in cleaning things up. I used to be a property owner outside Boston. And if you want to clean up the unbelievably messed up basement, you got to put some boots on and get down there. If you're going to clean up an area that had a sewage leak, you got to put some boots on and get down in there. And another thing, Jim, if you're going to drain the swamp, don't hire alligators to do the job. Well, we don't know exactly what Nuchin is all about. He's spent more time producing movies than he has anything else in, in the last year or so. But two years ago and three years ago, I think he was involved with the private equity uh, that were taking on hundreds of properties that were foreclosed. And I, I, he made some money, but he got out of that. I don't know what his agenda is, Rick. Will Trump be pro-gold? Oh, I think very much so, and it, it might lead to his his. Uh, oh, I hate talking this yeah, way. Yeah, let's it might not be, even go there. Yeah, yeah, he might end up in, on a long list with Buchanan and and McKinley, but not. You know, Lincoln is kind of that of that ilk, but not not quite. He owns a Continental Dollar and all. And it's a very very uh, ugly scene. But let's just put it that most presidents who run on the gold standard uh, don't live long. Let's just leave it that way. What about FACTA? Well, you think he'll repeal FACTA? I think FACTA is going to be repealed with the launch of the new dollar because the U.S. is going to lose control of the internationally held dollars. And that'll be the end of the end of the FACTA story. End of the FACTA nightmare. All right. Jim Willie, if you want more of this man's insight into the financial affairs of the world, you should be 